What I see in your bow arm is that you play with one angle of the bow. I don't know if you notice it, but basically you put the bow and you always face with your frog, you face the audience. So when you play on A string and you start the note on an A string, it actually sounds pretty good. D string, okay. G and C, it starts to sound a little bit like this, like I call it fufu sound. And just to prove the point first without the bow, take your right hand and just put it around the fourth position of the cello. And just drop it down, just naturally, just drop it down. Drop, drop your hand, yeah. Now let's imagine that instead of putting it here, you put it like in the cupboard behind you or in the photo behind you. Okay, reach really high. Now drop it. Yeah, you see, so the, the, the further you go in that direction, the bigger the half circle would be. It's just physics. However, the smaller you go, so let's go to C string now. Put your hand like in the C string, yeah, and just drop it. The half circle is much, much smaller, which means that if you take your bow and you hold it like a pole in the gym, hold it like this for a second, and just move it to this side, the other side. Yeah. Now go back and just do like morning exercises like this. And if you can see what happens to your body, it becomes like what I call a door hinge. See, your hips are starting to move with the bow. Now this is sort of the angle of the four strings on the cello. So you have to be attuned to it. So when you play, look, I'm just going to show you again the C string. If I play the way you play, just the last D of the Saraban, you play. Now I'm just going to change the direction and not do anything with weight and speed. Swear to God. I mean, it's just a different cello. Now what am I doing? I'm attuned to the physics of the angle of the cello. That's it. So can you take your bow and on C string, can you, with your thumb and pinky, can you do this for a second, just like you, you have a sore in your hand, and you go back and forth? Good. Now, can you do like a, um, a windshield wipers, sideways? Good. Now, can you do this sideways as if you're holding the bow? Just thumb and pinky. Good. Excellent. Never see that when you play. <laughs> I never see this motion. Now, let's point the tip of the bow to the public as if it's a gun and you want to shoot somebody. God forbid. Yeah? Okay, now put it on the C string in the frog under the silver part. Now bite the string and just bite it and go. Good. A little bit more motion. Can you do it a little bit, not just... <laughs> just move your hand a little bit, but this angle. Good. Now, imagine, I don't know if you've ever gone to the Yarkon uh, um, and, and, and row a bow, but if you do that, yeah, if you row a bow, if you go back, it's very hard for your hands, but when you do this motion and you go back, that's really a C-string motion. So, to have your hand right here for the C-string, can you try to do it, do a circular motion and put your hand at the end of it. Now, go back to the frog, go back to the frog position and feel that you're rowing a bow with a bow. Good, good, so that's the motion. Now, you never do that. You never do it, you always play like this. It just has no sound, okay? So, I want to do an exercise where we play, we're gonna activate now our body. Before we go, and I wanna start with the Saraband, if you don't mind, and let's do this uh, exercise. We're gonna play a low C, and then took two octave higher on the, on the A string. And we're just going to do a few notes. So C, and on the down bow, C on the A string, which is leading by the frog on A string, leading by the tip on the C string. So C string, change the angle of your body, A string. Right? 
Yeah, good. I, I believe you don't have an external external mic, no? You don't have an exten external mar no. mic to your... Yeah, I can hear that. Anyway, we'll try to imagine <laughs> the sound because normally I suggest if you can have an external mic these days, it's sort of common just to get the sound better. You're doing it now with your hands. You're not doing it with your body. Can I see that your door hinge, the door hinge is really changing? <laughs> motion with your hips. Try. Try. Yeah. So concentrate for a second. Imagine that somebody is pushing your body backwards to this direction, to the right side, and then they push you to the, to the left side. So you roll the sound backwards, and then you go the other direction. Yeah? So your body becomes the angle of the strings of the chair. Try. Good. Good. You can do much more of it, but let's now try to apply it to the saraband. When you play the D, the first D, Let's say that the, the borderline between G and D string is where you start changing the angle of the bow. So when you play the D, the first D, I would change, you see I'm changing the angle as I go with the bow. Now, to receive this, the D on the chord and to really bite it well, I turn my body on the up bow turning. Now I'm turning the bow. Yeah, you do this. Now you're working hard, you're very talented and musical, so you're vibrating a lot trying to get the sound or you're pressing a lot, but you're not tuned to how you can make the sound like, I can call it solar energy. Just by tuning the bow, and I'm talking about millimeters, millimeters. Now, tip to the public. Change. Again, tip. Try once just to experiment with this body and sound connection. Can you try, please? just human motions. This kind of motions is something that we do always in life. I mean, if you grab your iPhone from the table and you put it back on the side of your bed or something, whatever, this motion, we do it all day long. We never think about it. But, you know, frog on A string to, frog, to tip on C string, it's a totally different physicality of the body. And if you will be more tuned to it and in your playing, you will get much more core to your sound just by, by doing that. So a really good exercise to get to know that, what I call door hinge, is to, to play a scale up and down on the cello, going from C and A string. It's very, very good exercise. You can do it on down bows or up bows, yeah? Now, next point that is also connected to sound quality. Overtones. Our cello has natural overtones. I call it like tickling points. You know, like uh, the person that you know really well, you know, like here or here or whatever it is, that always there's a point that if you touch, it's like, ah! you jump. Cello has the same thing. There are notes on the cello, and I call them the four 
pillar notes. You know what's pillar? Like Amudim. He has the four pillars of sound. And the four are our strings. A, D, G, and C. Do, so, la, re. Why? Because that's what we have. If we would have an E, we would also have the E. Now, every time you touch one of those four notes, the cello must feel like this. And when you play, it doesn't because you're blocking it. So even the first D, yes, of course, you can vibrate it, you can do the angle, but if you're not exactly on the point that makes the cello tickle and ring, the D string will not feel the tickling. Yeah? So there are a few ways to do it, but the first and foremost important way is to play it in tune. So let's go what I call overtone walk. Okay, let's go for a little walk of the cello. Play first D with second finger. And I know it's not allowed, but look, look at the cello and see that your D string is really moving like crazy just by the angle, the movement, and the placement of the left hand. You see like, try. I can't see it, and I can't hear it because of the external mic, but can you at least show me a motion that is not a just a little bit more rounder motion. Thank you. Now, very good. Very good. Now, play the low D. And because of placement and motion, I want to imagine, I can't see it and hear it now, but imagine that the A string is also ringing. The A string has to move as well, so look at it and make sure it rings. Good. So now, when, let's start the saraban and let's see, and I want you to look now, I know it's not allowed when we play cello, but now I want you to use a sense of eyes, the, the looking sign, just to see that the string that's supposed to be tickle is actually tickle. And don't vibrate now, let's let the cello do it by itself. Now this D, I want to see the A string moving. Can you try? Talk to your instrument and see if you can tickle it on the D and the A string. Yeah, so for, good. For all the chords that you play, that's the third point I want you to um, think about. Yeah, we talked about angle, angle of the cello angle of the body. We talked about overtone. Each point uh, obviously takes more than five minutes, but that's the nature of masterclass. The third point out of only four that I will bother you with today is how to play chords. You are playing chords like Karate Kid. You know the movie? Yeah? So you have at least two speeds for a chord. You do two motions for a chord. You do this. And um, I wouldn't even do it in Elgar. Many cellists do it in Elgar. No, please don't do that, because by doing the second motion of the karate, you're killing the first one. This is a very aggressive, and you kill the overtones. So when you play a chord on the cello, hopefully also on violin and viola and double bass, think of one circular motion, one speed. One speed. So I don't want to hear a hole between the two lower string and then the two upper string. You do this. Can you do... Like in Elgar. One speed. Yeah, you do... Don't do that, please. So, can you do once just open strings, the, the lower three strings? And move the body with the one motion bow. Can you try? No. No, you do it. If I, so if I put letters to your chord, it's two T's. Ta-tam, ta-tam. You do this. And I would like to see if you can do wham, wham, W-A-M, wham, Wham or P A M, pam, pam, but not ta tam. Try. Pam, 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 pam,
right? Better. Now, you do it beautifully with your elbow and with your, with your palm of the hand and fingers. Can you do it also with your lower back, with your hips? Yeah? Can you try? No, no, now you do this. Sorry, Tzuf. No, you do this. You go the opposite direction. Can you go with the bow? sounds much more like an um, organ in a cathedral rather than two kids fighting in karate fight. Try. No, 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 you're doing the motion, sorry. No. No, Tuf, you're doing this. Ta tam. Ta tam. Concentrate. Concentrate. One motion. One motion. That's it. Thank you very much. That's it. Now try with the chord. Try with the chord. Thank you. Thank you. Now play the beginning with overtones, with body movement, and with nice one speed chord. All three elements, please. much better. Even without the external mic, I can imagine that it's much better sounding in your living room now. But it, it really does sound better, looks better. And as a great violin teacher, Galanian, used to say, if it looks better, it's probably sounding better. So I always remind myself this during this time of Zoom lessons and online lessons, what Galanian used to say. If it looks human, if it looks beautiful, it probably sounds beautiful. So even if I can't hear it, I, I believe it now because it is better. Okay, for the Alamant, what, what nationality this dance is? German. And Saraband? Spanish. Good, so you did your homework. I just wanted to make sure. But you know that the Boeings, um, we don't have, we just don't have his own Boeing. We have his wife, his student, but not his. Um, I once heard... Um, speculation by musicologists that I, I like to believe in because um, he mentioned that, you know, Anna Magdalena Bach, which we have uh, the edition, um, she had, they had 20 kids. Now you can imagine what it means, if maybe you, you can imagine, I know what were three kids, not 20. But when you have kids in a house and you have to cook all day and to clean and to organize everything and to make sure everybody's doing their homework and so on, and then at night, you go to the attic upstairs and you start copying with a candle, not with electricity, and sometimes it's really cold or really hot, and you sit there at midnight, you know, with your eyes half closed, and you start copying. How accurate would that be? This is just one opinion that I read. Um, having a family now and having life, I can sort of attune to it, um, which emphasized my point that I wouldn't take it like it's a Bible her voice. Even more so, when you talk to Baroque players and you listen to Baroque music, you realize that most of the expression is in the articulation, in the bow. And there are so many variations on how to use the bow. But what I want to do with you, because we don't have much time, I want to give you five options. Five options of bowings for four notes in a row. And I want to do sort of a jam session. You know what's a jam session? So I want to do with you a little Baroque jam session of boings and to see if you can actually, God forbid, improvise the boings in the Alamat. So the first option would be four separate notes. Okay? 
Second option would be two and two. Third option would be three and one. Fourth option would be one and three. And fifth option would be four in a bow. And I want you now to play it slow once. And let's see if you can just walk around those options. Five options only. Do it very slow. Maybe two and two. One and three. trick points that many times get you to the tip and to be glued to the string and to be much more talkative with the bow with those five options. So do it one slow. First play the five options. Separate, two and two, three and one, one and three, four in a bow. Try. Well first just do the menu. Tuff. Tuff, wait, just play this. And then two and two. I just want to see that you know all the language that we have now, which is only five words. Good. Now, really slow. Yum, ti, da, 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 di, da, dum. Really that slow. Okay, and I want to see if you can literally improvise, tell me a story with those five options. because it's, uh, it's improvising and it's not my like so improvising articulations which is not my, uh, my comfort speciality side. yeah uh, I highly suggest first of all it was much more interesting for me to listen to I know that when I play a, a bass suite and I think in that way um, it's more interesting for me as a player I always tell a story with it um, that leads me really to the last thing that we have to work on, but this was so much better. And I highly recommend that you practice those five options in a two octave scale. So you just do a scale, let's say um, D minor, and you do two and two. Yeah, or you do three and one. Go up with two and two and go back with three and one. Yeah, and remember, this is from the Sarban, but when you get to C string shoot somebody in the public with the tip of the bow. Yeah, but that was really great. Now, when you do it in a scale, this is very common bows in Baroque style music. You don't realize it, but when you play it, or actually when I tell any students to do that, you start doing something that you simply don't do when you play Bach, which is to lift your bow and to place it in home base zone, I call it, where it's comfortable. You play and you glue the bow to the string. 
you play <laughs> change the bow when I ask you to do it uh, first time slow, you preferred the what I call magical area where we create colors rather than the talking area where we can lift and speak with the bow. However, when I ask you to do it in a scale, it was a different story. You did this. say would go further in history of music. Mozart, would you ever hear violinists playing uh, like this? No, it would be... I mean, that's the area of creation, and you never use it. So finally, to let you go, I want you to apply this when you play, to unglue your bow and to become much more baroque player which is, if you play on a Baroque cello with gut string and Baroque bow, it's very hard to sustain. Possible, but much harder. So, if you play and you want to do two and two, don't stay here and glue it. Go back. Now, whatever you want to do, jam session of boings, or you can be a baroque DJ, I like to call it. So, make me dance now and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Bye-bye.